Hello. In this video, I'm going to look at using an RC radio control with a Raspberry Pi Pico. In the video, I'll explain about iBus, how you can get an iBus receiver, and how you can interface that to a Raspberry Pi Pico or other microcontroller. I've already created a video using an RC with a Pico, but that was based around reading the PWM signal. In this video, I'm going to look at using iBus which provides an easy to use and more accurate way to interface with a remote control. In my earlier video, I used C++, but for this example, I'll be using MicroPython, creating my own craft library to make it easy to include in your own code. I'll be using Raspberry Pi Pico, although this should work with other microcontrollers that support MicroPython. I'll be using Raspberry Pi computer to program the Pico, but again, you can use other computers for the programming. First look at what iBus is. It's an alternative way of interfacing a radio control receiver with an onboard microcontroller, typically in a plane or other model. It's a serial based protocol and it's used for receiving data from RC controllers such as those created by FlySky. The FlySky controller that I'm using is designed for model aircraft, including drones, but it can be used for other purposes. It's reasonably priced, is often paired with an FSIA6 receiver, but for this you'll need to have a FSIA6B receiver, or a different receiver which has iBus capability. These are usually slightly more expensive than the standard FSIA6, which only supports PWM. First consider what a remote control does and how it's implemented. This is based around my previous video using the FlySky FSI6 controller and the FSIA6 as a receiver. But it's typical of many different controllers. For simplicity, I'm going to talk about the FSI6, which is this controller here, as a transmitter and the FSIA6, which is the device here, as the receiver. In reality, the communication is bidirectional, as the receiver can send information about its own internal voltage, and the receivers that use iBus can also send back sensor information. The controller, or transmitter, has a number of levers and dials. These are sent as six channels. I'll cover those in more detail later. The transmitter converts the movement of these dials into a digital signal, which is then transmitted on the global ISM band of 2.4 GHz. This is an unlicensed frequency, often used by home Wi-Fi and various other wireless devices. The signal is received by the receiver as a digital signal. The controls on a model aircraft often use servo motors, so at this point the signal is converted into a PWM, pulse width modulation signal. I've covered PWM in my other videos, see the link in the description. But essentially, pulse width modulation is a way of representing an analogue signal to a digital input, by varying the length of time a signal is on and off. In my previous example, I used a Pico microcontroller to decode these back into a digital signal. The problem with this is that we're receiving a digital signal, converting it into PWM, effectively turning it into an analog signal, and then converting it back into a digital signal. This introduces errors, but also means the microcontroller spend a lot of cycles decoding the signal back into a digital form. So this is where iBus fits in. So first you could just swap the FSIA6 for an FSIA6B and this can still work in exactly the same way. You can still use this with PWM if you want. But now we can remove all these channel wires going to the microcontroller and replace it with a single connection which represents the digital signal of all the channels. And this uses a connector labelled as iBus. iBus is a serial protocol, so it can read that with the UART on the Pico. It's half duplex, using only a single pin to send and receive data. 
the UART and the PCO can also act in half duplex. It has two separate pins, one for transmit and the other for receive. For the example we will use, we'll only look at the incoming signal provided by the iBus servo pin. If you wanted to send data back to remote control, such as sending the battery voltage level, then you would need to combine the transmit and receive on a single UART using a diode to prevent data being received on its transmit pin. That's not something I need and it will add more complexity, so I'm just going to use a single UART for this example. I'll briefly mention an alternative technology which is SBUS. SBUS and IBUS are similar technologies and they work in a similar way. The main difference is that the SBUS signal is inverted, so potentially you need to invert the signal. This could be done before the signal reaches the microcontroller perhaps using a MOSFET inverter, or by using a software library that can handle the inverted signal. The protocol is also a bit different with the iBus supporting a couple more channels, but for most purposes, either could be used. You could use either of these protocols, but I've only used iBus. That's because the controller that I have is a FlySky controller, which uses iBus. If you wanted to use SBus, then you'll need to find appropriate libraries or develop your own code to handle the incoming signal on the PCO. This is the receiver I'm using, the FSIA6B. It's similar to the FSIA6, although the pins are pointing out of the back of the device instead of pointing upwards. But there's an additional row of pins at the top, which is used to support IBUS. Here we can see the pinout of the FSIA6B. The bottom set of pins is wired the same as the FSIA6 pins, which is that each channel has three pins. The top is the signal, the center is plus five volt, and the bottom pin is ground. This is repeated for all six channels. And then the final row is for the power supply. And it's also used when pairing the receiver to a different transmitter. These would be used by the servos, but we don't need any of those. Instead, there are two sets of three pins across the top. These follow the same configuration, the right pin being the signal, the center for five volts, left one is ground. The three on the left are used for connecting sensors to feed information back to the controller. It's the set on the right we need, which handle the incoming signal from the controller. These provide the data and the power supply. These pins can be used to power the receiver. So we can connect the, that to the five volt supply on the Pico, or to an external power supply, capable of between four and 6.5 volts. And if you're using the USB for the Pico, then the VBUS pin, which is pin 40, should be at around about five volts. So that one could be used. The ground needs to connect to one of the ground pins of the Pico. This is the case even if you're using an external power supply, in which case the Pico and the receiver power supplies will need to have their grounds connected together. The final connection is the data signal pin. This needs to connect to the receive pin of the UART on the Raspberry Pi Pico. There are two UARTs on the RP2040, which can be used on the GPIO pins. By default, UART0 is on pins 1 and 2, and UART1 on pins 6 and 7. I sometimes use UART0 for communicating with the Raspberry Pi, so we'll use UART1 for receiving data. This only needs the receive pin, which is GP5, physical pin 7. Something to be aware of is a potential voltage conflict. The Raspberry Pi Pico runs at 3.3 volts and can not tolerate much higher voltages. If you try and connect a 5 volt signal to the GPIO pins, then it's likely you will damage the GPIO pin on the Pico. There's not much information on the receiver, and the official data sheet does not mention the voltage of the iBus connection. Some sites refer to it as being a 5 volt TTL, and if that's the case, then it could damage the GPIO pin of the Pico. I measured the actual voltage using my USB oscilloscope and it actually appears to be around 3.5 volts. This is just within the maximum of the Pico, which is designed for 3.3 volts, but can go up 
to 3.6 volts. If you're using an external power supply or using a different receiver, then you should check the voltage. If appropriate, you may need to use a voltage level shifter. In this case, I connected straight to the Pico. You should always do your own checks first to avoid risk of damage to your Pico. So with the warning out of the way, I just connected straight from the top right pin on the FSIA 6B direct to physical pin 7 of the Pico. Now onto the software side. I had a look at some existing libraries first, but most of them were in C or were complicated to use. I'll link to some examples on my website which I use for inspiration. And they may be useful if my library does not support the particular feature you need, such as sending data back to the controller. I created my library just using MicroPython and placed it in a separate class, which makes it easy to call from your own code. And it's called iBus. I'm going to take it that you've already set up your Pico with MicroPython. If you need help on that, then I've already covered that in another video. So here there's a single file called iBus. .py, and that file should be uploaded to the Pico first. This can be done through a file by browser, or if you open it in Sony and use the Save to MicroPython device option. So I'll just save a copy, MicroPython device, and I've already saved it there, so I'll just overwrite that one. This file contains the class iBus. The init constructor takes a UART number, which should be 0 or 1, depending on which UART you want to use. It defaults to a baud rate of 115200 and sets the number of channels to 6, which is the number of channels on the FSIA6B. I've included that last option for the, those that want to use other receivers, but I've not been able to test any others, as I have only, only have the one receiver that supports iBus. It then creates a list and puts zero into each of the channel's values. This is so that I can put data into the list without having to check there is space allocated. It just makes the later code a bit easier. The main code, or the main method, is just called read. Whenever this is called, it reads the data from the receive buffer and returns it as a list. The first entry of the list will be a status value. One is used to mean that it's read from the receiver successfully. And the other values are then for each of the six channels, providing the values that are sent from the controller. If the signal is lost, then they will continue to hold the same values. I'll cover more about the significance of that later when I explain about the actual operation. The code makes 10 attempts to read the data whenever it's called. And this helps with reliability. It checks for the first byte to be a hex value of 20. And if so, then it's taken as the start of a valid string. Then runs a checksum against the received data, uh, make sure it's valid. And if it is, then it updates the channel values. It's important that this method is called regularly. Otherwise, you may end up with delays as the old data continues to be read into the UR buffer. The best way to do this and to avoid any delays is just to read it in a regular loop, checking for the status as often as you can, which we'll see in the demonstration. I've also created a static method called normalize, because the problem with the raw data from the receiver is understanding its value. Uh, you could of course handle that in your own code, but I created this method as a way to turn the data into a form that's more easily understandable. Most of the controls, then you just pass the raw data for that particular channel and it'll convert it into a value between minus 100 and plus 100, with the central position having a value of zero. For the dials, which in this case are channels 5 and 6, you can add the optional parameter type equals dial, 
and it will instead give you a value between 0 and 100. Note that these values may not be exact, depends upon the calibration of the controller, so you may want to allow some tolerance in your code. So with that out of the way, um, you can then create your own code which utilises this. I've just created a basic test at the moment called ibus-test and this just outputs the values to the USB port which will be shown in the Thony shell down here. As you can see this is very simple, it's only a few lines of code. I import the ibus library that we've created, I create uh, an instance of the ibus class and I just pass it value one, which means use UART number one. And then there's just this while true or run forever loop, which reads in the current value into a list called res, which is short for results. Um, I've just shorted it to reduce the amount of code. I then print that using the normalized method to convert each value into an appropriate range. All these lines as shown here are actually just, it's just a single line that's continued over. and I've just put line breaks in there to make it easier to read. I've also included a print to indicate that the elapsed time, which is number of ticks in milliseconds, typically this is milliseconds since the microcontroller has been running. I only use this for testing purposes and it's just useful to be able to see that the value is still changing. And then there's just some handling if there's an error, if it's offline then it will just display status offline. Um, in this case, it'll wait for half a second before it tries again. But otherwise, once this loop's done, it reads the value in straight away. So it's going to run as fast as it can get a response from the receiver. So I'm going to test the code. So I'm just going to um, use play to run the code. I recommend that you start running this code before you turn the controller on. It's to avoid a condition where the buffer is already full when you start. You can do it the other way around, but you may need to wait a short while before the output responds to changes in the controller position. So if I run, initially it says status offline, and to turn the controller on, and as you can see it started outputting values. Uh, note that these values are not necessarily at zero. They're actually quite close, close because I've been adjusting them. Um, one thing you can do is to calibrate the signal by adjusting for the central point. So if we take, for instance, channel one, uh, which is here, that's actually showing zero at the moment, but you can tweak it. If you had a higher value, say 0.8, you just use the little button next to the controller to adjust it so it is at zero. Uh, the, most of the controls are self-centering, apart from the, the left one. Um, so it's, uh, it's just a case of letting them go to their natural position and then adjusting them to get them as close to zero as you can. Once connected, then this does appear to be quite reliable. I'm just going to go through the different channels. So channel 1, if I move it to the left, it goes to minus 98.2, back to 0, and then over to 100. Channel 2, currently at 0, takes it to minus 99.6, and up to 100. Channel 3, goes down to minus 100, and up to 95.6. This one's not self-centering, so its center position is really based on your accuracy as well. 
and channel four goes, in this case, only as low as minus 88.8, .8 and it's up to 94. So you just have to bear in mind that there are a few different, um, a, a bit of variance on these. Uh, channel five and six, I turn these back down to zero. These are the dials on the top. And these are actually very accurate because I think it uh, self compensates inside the controller so it goes from 0 to 100. And the same with channel 6, which is the rightmost one. So these values are quite reliable and respond quite quickly to changes. Um, but one thing that did surprise me is what happens if you turn the controller off. If I turn the controller off here, I'll just set the values first. The controller's gone off. As you can see, the values aren't changing at all. This was a bit of a surprise to me. I expected to get a different status message back. I expected to get no signal, and hence I could handle that differently. But um, after looking at my code and, and, and convincing myself it wasn't my code, I actually verified this by connecting to an oscilloscope and it appears with this particular receiver that even if it loses signal it will continue to give the last value received. You can see this here, this is my logic analyzer. I've only got the top one connected and this is just monitoring with nothing running at all. I start the code running. And it's currently offline, so you've just seen a single square wave. And this is with the signal running. So you can see these blocks of data. If you zoom in on these, these are the ones and zeros being transmitted for the UART signal. And if I cut the signal, then I expect that to change. But there we go, I've just turned it off now. It's gone offline, and the data that is being sent is still the same. You can just expand those slightly so that you can see that these are square wave signals. You could just capture. There we go, so you can see the different width of the signals and this is the serial encoded data. I guess this makes some sense in certain circumstances. If a model plane briefly loses control, you wouldn't expect it just to shut off and fall to the ground. But when using iBus and, and connecting it to a microcontroller, it would be useful to know if the signal had been lost. I do understand that different receivers handle this in different ways. So if you're using a different receiver, then you may want to handle that differently. And that's pretty much it so far. In summary, iBus is a much better way of handling commands from a radio control than my previous experiments using PWM. It reduces the number of pins required but it also reduces the workload of the PICO. So instead of having to decode the PWM signal, it can just take that digital data. And as such, it's, it's a lot more reliable. So far, this has just been an introduction to the technology. I do intend to use this in a future robotics project. Here's a little teaser of the kind of projects I'm thinking of, which is a variation on my Raspberry Pi mechanism robot. So if you find that interesting, then please subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified of my future videos. I hope you found this useful. Thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you in a future video.